Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. So there's been a lot of news recently and we've certainly talked about it on our show as well but adam has mentioned where some of these breaches have compromised the signing tokens or the mfa tokens in the background or session tokens and recently the homeland security uh, cisa agency has also put out some warnings for their customers and companies to protect their cloud-based accounts and to enable MFA and that even with MFA, some of these criminals have bypassed that. Of course, if you've been listening to the show, one of our very first shows was to enable MFA to make sure that your cloud-based accounts are protected. And it's one of those things that I think Adam mentioned that it's 99.9% effective against reducing attacks against your cloud-based accounts. So definitely do it. But what you may not be aware is that there are ways to get around and either circumvent or steal the session tokens so that it defeats MFA. So what we're going to dive into on this show today is a tool called evil jinx this is something in my red team studies in my certified ethical hacker um, has come up as a tool it's part of the kali linux tool set a lot of red team or pen testers actually use it to test whether or not they can steal the session tokens for mfa but also of course it's being used by cyber criminals so what exactly is evil jinx adam so before we even get into evil jinx let's let's back up just a half step and let's let's talk about an important concept to understand and that is once you've authenticated to a service, usually a web service. And this is, by the way, not specific to anything Microsoft or Twitter or Facebook or whatever. This is just kind of the way authentication and authorization are done when it comes to web-based services due to the nature of the web, the web being created and not really designed for this purpose. I authenticate username, password, Maybe you ask me for another factor, like a text message or push notification. But when all that's done, the service that I'm trying to sign into sends me what Andy just referred to as a session token or a session cookie. And that is considered a bearer token. And what that means is I possess that token. If I present it to you as a service, you let me do whatever. You say, oh, well, you have the bearer token, so of course, I'm gonna let you do your thing. And anybody who possesses that can hand that over and gain access. That's the really important concept to understand is the the secrecy, the privacy of that token is really, really critical to maintain. If somebody else steals it from me, they can um, replay it and then use that to gain access to a thing. So that's kind of foundational concept to understand before we talk about evil jinx specifically. And the idea of evil jinx is, wouldn't it be great as an attacker, as a red teamer, whomever, if I could steal that session cookie and replay it so I can gain access to the same thing you have access to? Then I don't need your password. I don't need your MFA. I have a perfectly good session cookie. So the idea is I stand up a proxy server, and I get you to connect to it somehow. And that proxy server sits between you as the person signing in and the service you're trying to authenticate to. And remember, this is not specific to any one vendor. You go to the URL, and it's close to the place you were trying to go, but it's not exactly right. But then it serves up a page that looks completely legit. Here's the thing. It is legitimate. 
it is actually that site passing through an invisible proxy to your endpoint. So all of the education we've done to teach users about phishing of like, look for weird graphics, look for misspellings, look for gram grammatical errors. None of those are gonna be present because it's the real deal. And so the person dutifully puts in their username, their password, maybe they get prompted for MFA, they complete that, then there's an exchange of tokens like we talked about, that session token comes down. The invisible proxy sits there and steals it, and now the attacker has that bearer token, and they can go show up to the same service and pass that off and gain access literally as you. So it's an MFA bypass, amongst other things, because you don't need it. It's not that it's defeating it, it's not breaking anything, it's not a vulnerability, it's just a fact of that's how authentication and authorization work on the web, and they're taking advantage of that fundamental architecture. Yeah, and so just to kind of break it down for our listeners, if you're not familiar with what Evil Jinx is, in essence, in the most simplistic manner, it is a man-in-the-middle tool, like Adam explained, a proxy server, but a man-in-the-middle tool where the attack vector is actually from phishing. So most likely you'll get an email of some sort with a link or something where a user will click on the link, which then will redirect it to this proxy server that you set up using Evil Jinx, man in the middle. And then the user being thinking that it is the real site will put in their username, password, do the MFA, and then Evil Jinx steals that MFA token. So that's a, a, a really good first point right there. I mean, we'll just pause there for one second. When we're trying to teach our listeners, how do you prevent this? Of course, the first step is prevent that phishing email from getting through, if possible, right? So have a good email hygiene solution, whether that's a proof point of Mimecast, a Defender for Office 365, to hopefully detect that and prevent that from coming through. And then second, and we'll just keep revisiting this as we go through the conversation, user education, of course. If your users are well-educated and know not to click on links from people they don't know or messages they're not expecting, that helps. And the domain is still going to be wrong. It's going to be close, but it's going to be wrong. So if they do hover over the link and try to look at it and see if it looks right, there's the possibility they could pick up on that as well. So continue, Andy, but just wanted to jump in there. Let's keep, as we go, as we talk, keep kind of hitting the pause button for a second and say, okay, now where could we have stopped it so far? And so since phishing is the attack vector, let's just kind of back up and think about how phishing attacks were done previously. The old way of phishing was getting some sort of web template or HTML that maybe looked very similar to the real web page, but were, was different, right? Like Adam said, this new type of phishing kind of bypasses through and actually sends you the real page, or whereas the old one the attacker would have to craft some sort of page that looked very, very similar. And then the user would put in their username and password, and then because the attacker has that web page, they would then have the username and password. MFA or 2FA would essentially defeat this tactic because if I have your username and password and I enter it in to the real site and you have MFA or 2FA enabled, then it's going to send you the code or you the SMS uh, text or the app push or whatever you have set up. And because I don't have that, you've essentially prevented me from accessing your account. Whereas this new way of doing it, since I have the session token or the authentication token for that session and I've stolen it, I can then replay it and I don't even need to have that MFA prompt even if you have MFA enabled. It's a really good illustration of the never ending cat and mouse game that is information security, right? How you had, to Andy's point, kind of that phishing 1.0 strategy of set up a lookalike page, try to harvest usernames and passwords. And so organizations broadly deployed MFA to stop that kind of attack. And it's very effective against that because attackers can still use name and password all day long, but if they don't have that other factor, they're going to be stymied, which is great. Attackers, of course, aren't going to just sit still and go, oh, darn, 
what can we do now? They're going to be clever and think of the next thing. And that's what they have done here in this attack. Now, there are a lot of security tools that also do something called SSL inspection or SSL decryption, where you're essentially man in the middling your own traffic, where you insert a certificate to inspect that traffic, right? And so you may think, well, what if the I use an encrypted connection or an HTTPS connection using SSL or TLS to take a look at that traffic? The problem is, is that Evil Jinx will establish that HTTPS connection with the victim as well, and it receives and decrypts all the packets. And so, and then it re encrypts it and sends it off to the real site. So the user is still going to see the connection as, you know, that green trusted lock or trusted site. They're still going to think that it is a trusted site but it is only being trusted to the evil jinx server versus the real site. Right. The evil jinx server has a valid certificate and has SSL and TLS set up correctly. So my browser says, yeah, we're good. The connection between me and evil jinx is secure. And uh, it is. So you know that it's doing its job, but again, it's kind of not telling the whole story, which is why there's somewhat of a false sense of security there. So why does this really matter? I think the main thing is that a lot of security professionals or organizations think we've enabled MFA and so we're good. I know that at my company, we've had that thought too, where we look at suspicious logins or different logs, sign-in logs of our users and something will pop up and we're like, well, we probably don't need to worry about it because even if they have the username and password, we have MFA enabled. And the important thing is, is that that is no longer the silver bullet. Just because you have MFA enabled doesn't mean that you're completely protected from all the different types of attacks that are out there. 99.9% is not 100%, right? <laughs> Correct. And, um, you know, again, attackers, they're going to, they're going to find a new way, you know, that they they had the golden years of phishing when it was super easy and life was good. And they, they know that that's becoming less effective. And so they're going to find new ways. The other thing is there's different levels of MFA as well with these different identity providers. We've certainly talked about many of them on our show before. For an Okta provider, they have something called their basic MFA package, and then they have something called adaptive MFA, which is a step up. Um, I actually just recently found out about it because I didn't know it existed, but it looks at some of the things that we've talked about from the Microsoft side that are parody, which are like looking at location, suspicious location, suspicious IPs, different uh, devices that may be signing in different browsers. So it kind of takes in all of those heuristics and puts it into their algorithm and spits out a risk score of some kind and says, Hey, this is a riskier sign in, or this doesn't look like a normal sign in from Adam. Maybe we should elevate a warning. Right. Or even if you had MFA disabled for a certain location, we're going to prompt the person for MFA. Or maybe even block it if it looked suspicious enough. So take a look at your identity provider and maybe they have a step up package that isn't just the basic MFA where they're not looking at anything. They're just providing uh, a method to attach an MFA to their sign-in, but they're going to look at the different heuristics and of that particular sign-in, right? 
Yeah. And, and so I've mentioned on the show a couple of times, I'm in technical sales at Microsoft and I sell our identity platform, Azure Active Directory. And so believe me, I would love to have an attack where I can go around and sell it to people and say, hey, uh, if you would buy my most expensive stuff, it would fix this for you. That would be awesome. Unfortunately, I can't exactly go have that conversation. Here's why. So like Andy mentioned, Okta has a solution that's going to look at the different factors of the sign in and assign risk to it and let you take different actions based on that. And Microsoft does too. We call it Azure Active Directory Identity Protection. And it looks at all those same sort of things. So you can say if this sign in is medium risk or high risk, then do this thing. The problem is usually the do this thing part of that is enforce MFA, require MFA, ask for a push notification or a text message code or whatever. That doesn't solve this. So if you think about it this way, the user's trying to sign in, they get redirected through that evil jinx phishing link that they clicked on, and that is going to look suspicious to Azure AD. It's going to be, we've never seen this device before. We've never seen this IP before. We've never seen this user sign in from there before. Most likely, it is going to flag that sign in as medium risk. But if your policy is, if risk equals medium, then require MFA, you're still not any better off. It hasn't solved the problem. And so I'm going to kind of tease where we're going to go next with this. There are controls that help with that, but you don't necessarily need the risk detection to get there. So that's that's another tool in our toolbox, and there might be a way we can configure it to be helpful. But by no means should anybody listening to this think, oh, darn, you know, I, I need to buy more licensing from my identity provider to, to really solve this. In most cases, you don't. You're going to need to do the, the fundamentals that that people have been telling you to do for a while uh, more strictly, I think. And, and I'm kind of teasing where we're going to go next, Andy. But um, that's a really good point that there is that risk-based detection. And it most likely will pick this up. But the question is, what kind of policy are you enforcing as a result of it? So most importantly, how do you protect against this type of attack? And we said in the beginning, it, the vector is phishing. So very first thing you should be doing is some sort of security awareness training. There's a lot of different products out there for phishing campaign simulations, and that is definitely something I would recommend. If you don't have anything in your company to do that, there's a point in the security maturity model where you would want to implement that. Obviously, there's some basics that you want to get first before you start simulating phishing attacks. But once you get the basics in, phishing simulation is very, very important. And you want to do it in, in an empathetic manner as well. Um, I think we mentioned during the holidays, there was a company out there that fished its employees and said something about giving them a bonus or something like that. And it was probably a little bit in poor taste. Um, but at the same time, I will mention this. We, we, re we have a phishing simulation platform. And what it does is it picks from thousands of templates. We don't actually pick the template that goes out to users. It's actually pretty slick. It'll pick from thousands of different templates. They look very, very real. It'll impersonate different in internal addresses like HR or af actually information security as well. It'll have logos. There's no problem putting like real logos out there. And then it'll it'll pick the wording. And one of our emails actually from the phishing campaigns was sent to an employee. And it came from HR, not really from HR, but simulated from HR. And it said something about having him contact HR because it, it essentially hinted that maybe he's losing his job. And... Obviously, in a pandemic, that is not something that you want to send to your employees, um, especially in the environment that we've had before this, this last year where a lot of people are actually losing their jobs. And my boss decided to handle that one because he actually escalated it to our department saying that, you know, that reading this caused him a lot of anxiety. 
it um he had been let go previously due to through an email so it, it kind of triggered some old feelings which is totally understandable but at the same time um when my boss replied and i actually really liked this way that he replied and i i would suggest if this type of thing came up at other people's company this is the direction that you would try to take it certainly don't take it in a manner of hey this is just the platform and this is the way it is we have no choice but the the point that my boss made was attackers don't really care that it's a pandemic attackers don't really care if you're at your lowest point and so the point of our phishing simulations is to try to teach you to recognize the clues but at the same time there is no good way of actually doing it in a in a manner that maybe is the best time for you or in the best messaging because Attackers will take advantage if it's a holiday. Attackers will take advantage if it's a pandemic. Attackers will take advantage of every single type of point that they can do to try to, to trick you. And so he wrote it in a very empathetic manner, but that was the point that he made was there's not really a good way to do this and say, you know, attackers are going to check with you first and be like, well, is this a good time for you? Like, is this a message that will ring true with you. Maybe we won't fish you today, right? They're not going to really care. They're going to fish you as based on whatever weakness that you have. Their emails are always designed to drive some sort of anxiety, some sort of you need to do this now or something bad may happen, right? It's always kind of a sense of urgency. Exactly. Sense of urgency. So yeah. that was basically the point that he made. And so I, I, I wanted to use that as an example for security training because you get a lot of pushback from employees, right? People don't really like phishing simulations. They don't like to be tricked. And certainly you don't want to use it as a, I don't like using it as a gotcha, as like a, a punitive manner. Like, hey, I, I got you. Now you have to take some training. My goal is to make sure that they recognize the clues and so that they don't click on the links. And if they click on the links, they click on the links and we have other protection for that. But out of a hundred people, if only one person clicks on the link versus 20 people click on the link, maybe our risk is reduced, right? Mm -hmm. And those attack simulation platforms are usually very inexpensive in the big scheme of enterprise software. And so they're a very worthwhile investment. I mean, compared to the risk they mitigate, they're they're very well worth it, for sure. Yep. So that's that's a really good point, and it's a tough point to communicate. But you're one hundred percent right. Even when it was last March, and and we are beginning to just deal with the the start of the pandemic, attackers were already using coronavirus, COVID nineteen, SARS CoV two in their um, messaging. They, they started immediately. There's always that sense of urgency that guides a phishing message. In fact, that's one of the warning signs you look for is there's a call to action right now. You must do this thing now or else. Um, that's, yep. that's a telltale sign of phishing, speaking of which. So yeah, that's, that's a really good response by your, your boss um, to, to lead with empathy, but at the same time to, to make the point that um, Unfortunately, attackers definitely do not have empathy and and do yeah. not have concern for your your personal circumstances and yeah that's that's tough that's a really difficult needle to thread and so that's that's yeah. probably about as well as it could have been done yeah i it, I think I took away from it because I think it's really tough. A lot of us in the security industry we may start off you know with this hard line and say, hey we don't want anything to happen. There's no gray area. It's black and white, but toting that empathetical like message and saying, this is not our intent. We certainly didn't mean to cause you any pain and we're sorry about that. I mean, that was what he led with. And then 
tagging on the fact that unfortunately, you know, attackers don't care. And so that's, that's the message. And, and we're not like picking this message to send to him, right? It was just unfortunate out of thousands of templates. This was the one that he got from our, from our platform. So, right. Um, another thing, and Adam mentioned this too, that an attacker does have to register a domain for evil jinx to work. And the domain will never be the real domain. So let's say you're phishing someone and you want them to go to your evil jinx proxy. You're going to have to register a domain, say, for like Facebook. It would be like Facebook with B00K.com or B00K.com. So it's going to be very similar looking domain. And if you're just glancing at it, you may not notice. And that's something to pay attention to. And you always want to check le the legitimacy of the base domain. Sometimes they'll link like a subdomain. So maybe it's Microsoft dot help dot com or something like that, right? It looks like it's Microsoft, but it, the base domain is actually help dot com. So you want to, and that's all part of your training to make sure that people know this is a base domain. This is where it's actually registered versus the subdomain looking at the registered domain to make sure that that is real. And I'll also mention a lot of email security tools where people are clicking on things. They'll help protect you from phishing as well because they'll redirect to a, a malicious site and it'll actually get blocked. However, one of the phishing training tools that you want to teach users, and Adam mentioned this too, is when you're hovering over that link, to see if that is actually going to the right domain. But a lot of email security tools actually rewrite those links to say like proofpoint blah, blah, blah.com or mimecast blah, blah, blah.com. And I don't really like that because it kind of takes the inspection out of it. One of our key training points is to hover over the domain and check it. But if you're rewriting it, then all the user knows is that it's going to Mimecast first or Proofpoint first or whatever. What I really like is that Microsoft recently made a change to Office ATP so that it actually displays the real domain and link. They used to rewrite it, but now they actually just do the inspection and the redirection on the back end. So if you if you have Office ATP and you click on a link from an email or, or hover over it, I should say, it will show you where it's actually going. But then if you click on it, it'll do the, the inspection and everything on the back end. Yeah, the link is actually still rewritten. It's just since Microsoft writes the email client as well as the protection product, there's a integration there where Outlook actually unwraps the wrapped URL and displays the original one, even though under the covers, it's still wrapped and you still get that protection. So that is a nice differentiator for that product. If, if that is part of your education, you can do that still with Defender for Office 365. Yeah, and I also mentioned one of the things I also like about the O365 Defender ATP, whatever it used to be called. <laughs> it sounds like sounds like Microsoft rebranded again. Um, uh, Microsoft Defender for Office 365 now. Mm -hmm. They also do links and attachments within the other Office products. So... Products like Mimecast and Proofpoint are great because they're they obviously you want to have some sort of email security and th and that's their primary job. They sit in front of your email and, and it's the first thing that your email hits. But what happens if I put a link within Teams or what happens when I put a link within an Office document or what happens if I attach something to your OneDrive or something like that? You know what inspects that? And so that's where I think Microsoft has a nice little integration. Because if you're using all the different things in Office, the Defender for O365 will kind of cover all of those things. Otherwise, I'm def depending on my other layers of security, like, for example, my endpoint protection, right? If I click on a, a link in Teams and it runs some sort of malicious script or downloads some sort of malicious file, 
then I'm probably relying on my endpoint protection or some other product that is going to provide another layer of security, or maybe I don't have anything at all, which would be mm-hmm. bad. You know, we've, we've spent a lot of time here kind of talking about protecting it on the front end from a phishing protection and user education and security awareness training. And that is all valuable. But at a certain point, we've teased that there is a hero or a couple of heroes to the story. And so the first one of them is going to be from the FIDO Alliance. And actually two, two solutions from the FIDO Alliance. So if you remember, Google did a really good job of being self-congratulatory as they rolled out their Titan security keys across their whole org and stopped getting fished completely. Um, that technology eventually became U2F, um, which stands for Universal Second Factor Authentication. And it's the idea that you have a hardware token that you physically plug into a PC or a Mac or whatever, and that acts as your second factor. So the important distinction here is you still do username and password, and then it says plug a thing in and push a button or whatever, put in put it in the USB port, and that acts as your second factor. But the benefit of that is that performs domain checking. It is linked to the specific domain you stood it up for. So if I have it configured for google.com and I'm on an evil jinx site that's g00gle.com, it's not going to work. It's going to fail because there's a domain mismatch. So now I have not completed a successful sign-in, and Evil Jinx wasn't able to steal a session cookie because one was never transmitted. Great. There's another FIDO technology that's a little newer that's also available. You may hear it referred to as FIDO2 or WebAuthn, but this is a true passwordless solution where it's very similar to the first thing I described, but the difference is that you don't have to put in a password at all. So for example, if you have a Microsoft consumer account, you want to sign into Xbox or you want to sign into Skype or Outlook.com, you can go click on, I have a security key before you even put in your username. You plug in your security key. Maybe it supports biometric and you scan your fingerprint. Maybe you tap the button and put in a pin, but then you're signed in. You never had to put in a username. You never had to put in a password. Now that also does domain checking. It's not going to activate against a fake domain. So really the benefit here is you have a machine that is doing domain validation instead of a human. That's why it's effective. That's why it works. So you'll see U2F supported on some sites like Google. You'll see FIDO2 supported on some sites, especially Microsoft does a lot of FIDO2 support. And that's kind of where things are headed. But both of those are effective mitigations against this. And so as an example, I know Azure Active Directory supports FIDO2. I believe Okta does as well. Um, And I think most of the IDPs, I think Ping does too. I think everybody's getting on FIDO too. And so that's certainly an option. It's still kind of bleeding edge. I don't think a lot of orgs are going to go deploy FIDO2 keys to all their users quite yet, but it's a thing. You know, you could, if you were really, really concerned about this, it's definitely an option. Um, And on that same note, Windows Hello can also act as a FIDO2 authentication and similarly would defeat this. Now, in an enterprise environment, you don't like use Windows Hello to sign in to Azure AD because you'd have single sign-on, so you'd never be prompted to begin with, but it would defeat that as well. So that's kind of in the same boat there. Um, But those are that's that's one method of mitigation against this for sure. Andy, did I miss anything in that discussion? No, I do want to add on to the the FIDO2 conversation because uh, you mentioned Okta has it, Azure AD has it. I actually just got it working as a factor for our Okta environment, and it's it's really slick. It works the same way I've done it for Azure AD as well. Um, but it's a good option, you know, for a lot of companies. Maybe you know, for us, we have salaried workers and hourly workers, and we've mentioned that not everybody has a smartphone. So sometimes you're defaulting to SMS as a factor, or maybe they don't even have a phone. We even have some employees who don't have cell phones. And so this is a great way to enable MFA. We also have lab environments where people aren't allowed to bring in cell phones or like, you know, in the government, like SCIFs, you know, where 
cell phones aren't allowed. And we've talked about how it's a bad practice in general, or it's not really a recommended security practice to have static IP zones to exclude MFA, right? Because what if the attacker gains access to your network and now you've disabled MFA for the entire subnet and they just need the username and password. And so having all those factors and the things that we've talked about using FIDO2 is a great way to say, I have MFA enabled. I don't need to have a cell phone or a smart app or use SMS as a factor. I have true security with a hardware token. Of course, there are other things to consider, like the cost of adding on a security token. Security tokens can get lost. They're just like if you have a badge and you need a badge to get into the building, right? Oh, I forgot my badge. Oh, I forgot my FIDO2 security key. Now I can't sign in. Those are all things to consider. But you know, when it comes to security, this is obviously the most secure one. Um, and so that's that's basically my take on the FIDO2 security keys. I mean, they're they're great. You can get them for as cheap as about fifteen bucks for a, a USB key. So it is a little bit of an investment. But um, and there's other other types of security keys like YubiKey or Yubico, where you have to manage like a ma- organization master key and then all of that has to be issued off from there. The FIDO2 and the WebAuthn generally are user-based enrollment where they're self-enrolling. It's super easy. All you need to do is buy them a, um, a FIDO2 security key, issue it to them, and then usually the IDP will recognize MFA if you've enabled that type of enrollment or MFA for them. They'll self-enroll. And then, of course, from the admin portal, if they lose it, you can just remove that factor and issue them just an, another blank key, and they would re-enroll. So um, it's pretty slick. It, it, I, I think when this is really going to take off is, and this is this all technology exists today. It's just a matter of putting it all together. You can do FIDO2 over NFC. And some of the very popular badge and key makers like HID they now offer badges that have FIDO2 keys baked into them. They're NFC. Mm-hmm. And so I see a, a not too distant future when you make every standard issue device in your organization NFC capable and all your badges are issued with an NFC FIDO2 key on them. And so your badge is also your key to sign in. You know, Microsoft used to do smart cards. In fact, my Microsoft badge had a smart card in it. I never used it. Um, but it, it was kind of a, a relic and it would be kind of weird to kind of go back to that, but it totally makes sense, right? I mean, it's it's a great model where, especially from an IT perspective, when we get into cost sharing and budgets and everything, usually IT is not responsible for like issuing badges to employees. That's somebody else's budget. And if you can piggyback off that and maybe pay just a pittance to get that NFC capability added on, now we're talking. Now we've got something where there's true cost share across the organization, and we have something that people already need to carry with them every day. It's not something additive. So I think that's kind of the nirvana future state that a lot of orgs will get to, but we're just we're just honestly not there yet. But that's something I'm really excited about, and I bet a lot of orgs really embrace. It's funny you mentioned that, because we're going to have a physical security episode in the future because it's one of those tenants of cybersecurity as well. But our org uses a vendor that has different types of cards. One of them is just a card to do access control with, but then it can have NFC integrated to that card. You pay a little bit more for the card, but that can act as a badge for entering the building as well as integrating with these type of you know, FIDO2 keys. And I've been meaning to try to get one of those cards. It's just tough to buy like separate individual cards for testing. But um, my goal was to try to test this as well. And and I think, like you said, Adam, this would be the, the, the golden state to get to if we could use that access card as the same one to just sign into our identity provider, which would be awesome. Mm-hmm. You did mention no. another... Um, 
method of mitigation, which I think kind of ties into our episode from last week, which it talked about modern device management, and we've talked about conditional access previously to that. But using device-based conditional access, which we alluded to in the beginning of the show, is also one of the best methods of mitigation against this. So there's a lot of different ways. Adam, I'll let you start, and then I'll, I'll kind of tie on some of the things that I've had experience with. Yeah, the perfect tie into last week. And and really this is this is the hero of the conversation today. So ultimately, I hinted at this. We're gonna get here. This is the state that really puts you in a position where you have mitigated this risk. Because what you're doing is you're looking for a known trusted device at sign in. And if you are looking for that, that evil jinx proxy is not part of your organization and is not trusted. And so you're not going to let it in. And therefore, you've you've essentially defeated the problem. So let me just step back and, and walk through that. So remember, evil jinx is that proxy, that man in the middle, as Andy referred to it. And it is creating a secure connection between that proxy and Azure Active Directory. And then on the other side of it, um, the, the client PC. And I'm just using Azure AD as an example. Remember, again, this is service agnostic. Um, so user gets fished, they click the link, they go to this site, it's you know some fake URL, but it looks like their normal Azure AD sign-in screen. And so they do username and they do password. And then they get a message that pops up on their screen that says, you're not coming in from a trusted device, so you can't get there from here, is the error message. Why did that come up? Well, because Azure AD said, hey, let's exchange our keys. Send me your uh, a, a proof signed with your private key so I know you are who you say you are and I'll match it up against your public key. And Evil Jinx goes, uh, uh, guys, I don't, I don't have anything to send. And so it, it falls down from there. And so this is true regardless of what device-based conditional access model you use. It works with hybrid Azure AD join. It works with require managed and compliant device. Really, the methodology doesn't matter. The fact that you're looking for a trusted device at all is all that's really critical here. But it essentially solves the problem. And um, again, I'm just giving a Microsoft specific example, but this, this could happen to any site. This could happen, uh, somebody stealing Facebook tokens or Twitter tokens or whatever. And they're actually in a worse place because they don't have any sort of that device relationship kind of technology. So this is where as an enterprise, you're actually better positioned to protect yourself from it because you can get to this state. And so just closing the loop on something I mentioned earlier, I talked about um, I, I, I talked about with the risk-based conditional access, and I was saying that unless you're requiring a specific control, it's not going to help necessarily, because they said most people will just do MFA. You could do, theoretically, if risk is medium or high, then require managed device. That would solve this. That would pretty much take care of it. Um, but if you're going to go to that point, why not just require a managed and trusted and compliant device all of the time? So that control doesn't really make sense in that context, but you could do it that way for sure. And so that's what I was hinting at before. Yeah, I, I think it would also make more sense to just have a compliant or managed device all the time, which is what we talked about last week with the modern device management, right? If you're trying to mm -hmm. access company data, I want it to be on a device that I know about and that I have some sort of say in. And so, like Adam said, all you need is to, to have some sort of compliance check. Is this device managed by Intune? If it's not, we deny access. Is this device hybrid Azure AD join or Azure AD join? If it's not, you deny access. And that, that is a simple, I mean, obviously there's other things in compliance policies, but in order to check that compliance policy, it has to be enrolled to begin with, right? So you can also do a couple other things like a static IP fence where you say only 
things that are within this IP address can access my company data. So it's not like saying I'm bypassing MFA. It's literally saying within this IP address, you can only access my stuff within this IP range. And so if it's outside the range, then you deny access. And something else that we'll get into in a later show, which is another method of managing your company data, is CASB solutions. Microsoft has one called Microsoft Cloud App Security. There's other CASB solutions. Um, Okta has something called Device Trust as well. Essentially, if you're trying to access a Okta single sign-on app, there has to be a trust that has been established between Okta and an MDM solution. It in- integrates with, I think, Mobile Iron, um, Intune, and then maybe one more. But there's some some integration there where it says, "Hey, you're trying to access an Okta device or an Okta app. Let's make sure that that device is managed, and that would stop this attack as well." Same thing with a cloud app security broker or Microsoft Cloud App Security and other cloud app security broker products where it may have some sort of device-based conditional access. For example, with MCAS, it can say from a device that is hybrid Azure AD joined or Azure AD joined or even domain joined using your root certificate or intermediate certificate that you upload to MCAS, it'll check that certificate on the device to make sure that that has the certificate and then you can access company data. So it's pretty slick, and that is from anywhere, right? So if I'm trying to, if I'm an attacker and I'm trying to access your company data on a device that doesn't have that certificate, I automatically get blocked. And in general, I I think one thing that just kind of came to mind here at the end of this conversation, so two kind of final notes. People ask me, of course, as somebody who represents Microsoft, they always say, well, what does Microsoft do for stuff like this? And we do require a managed device to access most company resources. There's a couple of exceptions of things you can do without a managed device, but they're kind of few and far between. So we, we do this today. Um, the other thing, too, that kind of goes back to putting it all together from a mitigation perspective is if you have a really mature single sign-on practice where everything just is SSO all the time and you have a really mature passwordless deployment or you're getting better at passwordless, those help too. Because, and I've told this anecdote before, but I'll tell it again because it's worthwhile. At Microsoft, we we do our own phishing campaigns against our users and you know report those results. And I forget the exact percentages, but they don't matter. But Microsoft's click rate is much higher than you would expect most organizations to be. People will click the link in the in the phishing simulation, but then when they get prompted to put in username and password, they throw on the brakes and they do not respond to that part of it, which is really the important part that we're measuring. And the reason why is we are so accustomed to passwordless internally, when something asks for your username and password, you immediately become suspicious. Um, I posted on LinkedIn just this week that I ran into like a really old legacy system that made me sign in with my username and password. And I had a moment to this week. That's a first for me. I forgot my corporate password. It's the first time it's ever happened to me in my entire corporate working life. And it's because I haven't had to use it in months and months and months at Microsoft because we're so passwordless. And of course, that helps. If I can't remember it, then I can't really respond to a phishing attack or sign into an evil jinx prompt either. So those are other things to think about too is, again, going passwordless helps with this. Uh, prompting users less frequency for si- frequently for sign-in helps with this. Uh, having really good single sign-on so users never see a prompt helps with this too. So those are other things that don't seem directly related, but anything that just causes users to put on the brakes, say, whoa, give it a little extra scrutiny, that all helps too. And for my final notes, I'll use an anecdote as well. Our company is very aggressive in our phishing campaigns to the point where the majority of our user base, we have a very high report rate. They will report 
everything as phishing if it's spam if it's a legitimate email if it has an attachment to it that they remotely think is they're not supposed to get they will report it as phishing and so we have to go through a very very high number of reported emails to check whether or not these are actually phishing and a lot of times I would say even up to half or maybe more than half of the emails that are reported are legitimate emails and then we have to return them back to the users. But at the same time, I'd rather have that than to have them be clicking on things or downloading things that they're not supposed to. So we have a very good and aggressive phishing simulation training, but that has gotten our user base kind of paranoid to the point where they're just reporting everything, which is fine. You know, if they're reporting legitimate emails, we just send them right back. So um, that's either way, once you get to some sort of maturity in phishing simulations, password lists, device-based conditional access, you know, that are all things that are going to help mitigate this. I, then, I love the, just the idea of scrutiny anywhere, right? Whether it's scrutiny of an email, whether it's scrutiny of a sign-in prompt, that's a win, right? If we have gotten users to go off of autopilot and sit there and go, I, I, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to report this. That's mm -hmm. a huge win. That is us winning the battle. So that's awesome to hear that, you know, I mean, it, it's a, it's a new set of challenges. It's kind of like more money, more problems, but ultimately <laughs> it's still a win. So that's a, that's really um, interesting to hear, you know, kind of where you get as you've really trained up your users. Yep. And then of course we'll mention it one more time. We've talked about this entire episode on how attackers can bypass MFA. That is not to say that you shouldn't enable MFA. You should definitely enable MFA. That is, if you don't have it enabled for your identity provider, for your cloud apps, that is the first thing that you should be doing. But then, of course, be cognizant that that is not a silver bullet. If you don't have the means to upgrade to some sort of device-based conditional access or adaptive MFA or whatever it is with your identity provider, make sure that you're scrutinizing those logs, doing other things like the phishing campaign training, which is very cost-effective. It doesn't cost a lot for those tools. They're usually anywhere between a couple thousand to maybe $10,000 a year for your entire organization. I mean, it's probably one of the cheapest security tools that you can get. So do the other things, enable MFA, and just be cognizant that that is not the silver bullet that it used to be. To use an analogy, think of um, think of the progression of antivirus solutions. So we used to just have signature-based detection, and that was good enough at the time. And as that is, attackers evolved their strategies against that. Everything became polymorphic and metamorphic and zero day. And you're, you're kind of wasting your time if you're not launching a, a new attack that's never been seen before because signature-based detection got so good and updated so frequently. This is kind of the same sort of thing. MFA is almost like your signature-based detection. It's not that you're going to get rid of it. You're not going to stop doing signature-based AV scans because they get a rid of a lot of the really low-value, easy attacks, and they force attackers to get more complex. That's kind of the same analogy here where you still need MFA because it stops the simple stuff, but we're to a point in the maturity process that we need to do more. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening as always. If you have any questions or topics that you want us to talk about on our show please reach out to us our contact information will be in the show notes we'll talk to you guys next week thank you for listening to the blue security podcast please check out the show notes catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes find andy on twitter at ajaw zero and adam at aj brewer see you at our next episode